Oh, the color. I can see the color. Yeah. Uh, so actually, we are uh, live now. Oh. Please let us know if you can hear us. If there is any problem with the noise, with the sound, can you hear us properly? Uh, we are very glad to welcome you all uh, to this fourth session of the uh, Brains Through Time Reading Club. We are talking about the invasion of land. Uh, we have, as usual, uh, Luis Puelles, Paul Cisek, and today we have Malcolm McIver, who I believe has been in most of the most of the talks, most of the sessions. Um, and we have a nice program. As usual, we will do a, a first introduction of the of the chapter. So we will summarize the main ideas. And then we will have Luis, who will talk about the evolution of Talamo tenencephalic connectivity. And then Malcolm will tell us about the water to land transition on, on visual system. Uh, so I hope people are hearing us because uh, I'm not seeing something, anything in the chat. So if there is any, if you can hear us, please let us know uh, because maybe there is some delay. Maybe we can wait. Is yeah, you're still... there, so... Sorry? Yeah. Okay. Usually there are thumbs up. Ah, okay. Katya, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I guess, uh, I guess, I guess we can uh, start. So Alex will do the the brief summary of the of the chapter, and as I was saying, Luis and Malcolm will uh, explain different topics that are relevant for this chapter. So I will mute myself uh, and let Alex. Thank you, Manuel. So welcome everyone to the fourth session of the VTT Reading Club. Uh, today, uh, we are going to talk about a huge step in vertebrate evolution, as Manuel mentioned, the colonization of land and how it shaped uh, terrestrial vertebrate brains. So let's start with a quick reminder of, sorry, of the last chapter when we talked about fish brain evolution from cartilaginous fishes such as sharks to the great diversity we find in rain, ray, ray fin fishes. So, sorry. Uh, but we left out another branch of, of the three, uh, the lobe fin fishes, which include salacans and also land fishes. And together with amphibians, they are the closest text and vertebrates to the pioneers who that invaded land about uh, 400 million years ago. For this reason, in today's chapters, we are going to, to focus on lobe fin fishes and also on these amphibians. So about salacans, they were a very diverse group in the Devonian, but they thought uh, they thought to be uh, extinct until 1938, when Marjorie, Curtin, and Latimer found one specimen in South Africa. Since then, even one more species has been discovered, although the scarcity of specimens have made very difficult to study them in details. About their brains, we can say that while relatively small, uh, they possess a large cerebellum, uh, thalamus, and telencephalon, while the optic tectomon sacus vasculosus remains quite small. Interestingly, these fishes also have a, a well-developed mechanosensory lateral line system, but lack typical electroreceptors. Instead, they appear to have a, a rostral organ, which is probably electrosensory. So the other main group of beza of love fin fishes are land fishes, which are more closely related to tetrapods than salacans. These fishes live in deep uh, river waters in slow moving uh, swamps with low oxygen content. They have huge genomes and very big cells in comparison with other vertebrates, a feature that we will revisit later. And their brains are similar in relative size to those of celacans, but they tend to have smaller cerebe cerebellum, optic tectum, and hypothalamus, among other structures. In general, their brains appear to be very simple with few migrated cells, uh, but they have a relatively large evaginated telencephalon. However, analysis on lungfish and docastes indicated that this, the their ancestors probably had a much smaller telencephalon than uh, those that exist today. The other, so the other group that we are going to talk about today are these amphibians. Uh, there are three major groups in, among living amphibians. They are collectively referred to as these amphibia. And we have the anurans, including frogs and toads, urodels, including newts and salamanders, and also the caecilians. Uh, among them, anurans are by far the most successful group. Uh, but all of them are characterized by having a smooth, non scaly skin, capable of gas exchange when moist. Also, 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 they also have lungs. Sorry. 
For this reason, uh, all these amphibians need to live in moist environments, also because they lay the they lay their eggs in water. But even with these constraints, most most of extant amphibians spend much of their time on land when adults. About their brains, uh, studies have mainly focused on neurons and a couple of salamanders. Salamanders, and we can say that in general, urodel brains tend to be smaller and simpler than neurons, which in turn are remarkably similar to those of sharks. But where do the, all of those least amphibians come from? There, was to, to, there has to be something between fish and frog, right? Fortunately, the, the fossil record tells us much about early tetrapods, the vertebrates that made it into land and are the ancestors of modern amphibians as well as amniotes. The first terrestria, terrestrial vertebrates, such as Antostega, uh, had quite robust legs, but they were more likely to use them to drag themselves rather than walk or lift their bodies. With time, their limbs and spine became more and more robust until they were capable, capable of lifting themselves and walking. By this time, a great diversity of tetrapods already existed, as you can see here in, in this tree, uh, with reptiliomorphs giving rise to amniotes and temnospondyls or lepospondyls uh, to lysamphibians. Here there is some debate about the true origin of lysamphibians, as it remains unclear to the day. But why did all these tetrapods look for opportunities on, on land? Exactly, as we mentioned before, lockfin fishes started their journey to land about 400 million years ago during the late Devonian, a period that was scarred with several mass extinction events. Uh, the fossil discoveries uh, correspond to coastal areas, mainly in New America. So this tells us that probably these early tetrapods lived in shallow marine habitats uh, and over time they moved into land to an each generation to an each generally devoid of predators and full of potential prey, as invertebrates had already moved to, to have already invaded land. Sorry. By the late Carboniferous, uh, fully terrestrial vertebrates had already emerged. But moving to land uh, implies overcoming several challenges, the most notable or, or of which would be air breathing. Evidence suggests that this ability was well developed before these animals actually moved to land and they probably go there at the surface into primitive looms, a behavior that can, can be seen also in extant fishes like better fishes. Furthermore, they might have been able to breathe through the spiracle and the external nostril, uh, both leading to the pharynx in a similar way as polypterids do nowadays. As they moved to land, they faced another serious problem, uh, the hydration. Uh, which would have compromised gas exchange through the skin and also the reproduction. To solve this, early tetrapods likely remain close to water bodies and reduce their size, their size. And additionally, they probably reproduced in water as do external amphibians. Differently, amniotes developed other adaptations in their skin, lungs and legs that may that made them less dependent on, on water. We will see more on that in the next chapter. So what about senses? Another major, major obstacle in the invasion of land by early tetrapods was that many of the sense organs of these animals had had evolved for use in water and did not work as well uh, in air. For example, the refractive index in water uh, is larger than that of air, and just as your own vision becomes blurry in water, um, that of aquatic animals becomes blurry in air. So evidence suggests that even before these animals became fully terrestrial, uh, early tetrapods roughly tripled the size of, of their eyes relative to body size, suggesting that these animals uh, probably spent a lot of time with their eyes just above the water surface. However, retinal structure remains without major changes, uh, without major changes, sorry, with all major classes of retinal neurons probably predating tetrapods, but retinal complexity likely increased as tetrapods in invaded land. Additionally, they also developed eyelids and lipidic tears to protect their eyes from dehydration. Hearing presents similar challenges to vision, as airborne sounds tend to, to bounce off animal surfaces rather than providing through them. For this reason, the auditory uh, systems uh, we find in fish are not appropriate for hearing in air. Uh, accordingly, terrestrial tetrapods evolved tympanic, uh, mem a tympanic membrane connected to a middle airborne. All the components of this system vibrate, vibrate with sound and transmit these, these vibrations into sensors in, in the inner air. However, available data from the fossil record indicates that the last common ancestor between neurons and amniotes lacked this tympanic ear, suggesting that air hearing may, might, be able, might have evolved independently in amphibians and, and amniotes. 
So uh, moving to LAN also implied losing the utility of the lateral line system, which is unable to function properly in air. Early tetrapods probably had both electro and mechanosensory lateral line systems, but in next time amphibians, the situation is far more complicated. Uh, larvae from these amphibians uh, do have a mechanosensory lateral line, which usually degenerate as the animal gets ready to, to emerge from water. But curiously, uh, some aquatic, fully aquatic amphibians, such as Xenopus, retain them for life. Uh, uh, also, some urodels are even capable of re-emerging these neuromas when they return to water for reproduction. Incredible feature. About the electro, uh, electrosensory system, urodels and caecilias possess ampullary electroreceptors, and some of them even retain them into adulthood. In contrast, and urans never develop these electroreceptors in the first place. So, as we saw in, in last chapter, in most fishes, the olfactory epithelium is directly connected to the environment through two pairs of nostrils. Uh, in contrast, in lung fishes and in tetrapods, there's just one pair as the other move to the oral cavity during, uh, during evolution. As a result, early tetrapods were capable to use the ne negative pressure to pull air or water into this epithelium, increasing uh, odor and delivery. Also, tetrapods and lung fishes possessed a bomeronasal system, suggesting that the, this bomerona, bome, oh, sorry, bomeronasal epithelium also arose at the onset of air breathing. Interestingly, uh, alpha and gamma families of olfactory receptors greatly expanded with the invasion of land, of land, while other families of receptors were completely lost. Of course, moving to land also had profound impact on the motor behavior of these animals as they went from swimming to other ways of moving, such as walking, hopping, or dragging themselves. Early tetrapods likely uh, swam by means of lateral undulation when in water, but were capable of walking on four legs. As mentioned before, this required not only a strengthening of the limbs and the spine, bones, and muscles, but also had important implications for the neural circuits that control their movements. For this reason, uh, early tetrapods evolved additional motor neurons innervating limb muscles, as can be seen on, with the enlargement of the brachial and lumbar segments of their spinal cords. Also, re recent developmental data uh, have shown that activation of the gene HOX9 at thoracic levels in the spinal cord suppresses the genes HOX6 and, and 10. Uh, which are needed to specify the, the limb motor neurons in the brachial and lumbar region, respectively. Uh, so these genes seem to have helped uh, specify both the phenotype and the position of these limb motor neurons. And given the, these observations, it seems that evolutionary changes in the expression of those genes helped to reorganize the spinal cord as tetrapods emerged. As part of this transition, um, Hox 6 and 9 genes probably shifted their expression caudally relative to the condition we find in fishes, somewhat creating a gap between the, um, the brachial area and the brain, somewhat creating a neck. So all of these new ways of sensing and moving had to be processed by the brain, which of course also underwent some changes as vertebrates moved to land. As we try to reconstruct the brains of early tetrapods, which living species might give us the best clues? Among extant tetrapods, these amphibians are clearly the best candidates because they are the only tetrapod amniotes and therefore lack the, the, innov the innovations that characterize amniotes. But which of these amphibians might be most representative of early tetrapods? While anurans are the most studied, uh, they seem to, to have some features that um, are quite different from, from their ancestors. Uh, an important feature that we have to, to keep in mind while looking at their brains is that most of these animals uh, have some degree of pyomorphosis in their development, which of course also affect their brains. Their brains. Pyomorphosis, as we explained in chapter one, is the retention by an organism of juvenile or even larval traits into adulthood while being capable of reproduction, while having mature gonads. The most classical example of this are axolotls, but also lung fishes. This could be related to the large genome size these animals had, maybe related to retroviral DNA, uh, and, their, and their consequent increase in the nuclear and cell size. Uh, it could lead, this increase in cell size could lead to difficulties in cell migration and a slowing down of their cell cycle, explaining the, the pyomorphic um, 
the biomorphic development. And on the other hand, the cell size, cell size increase could also be a metabolic adaptation to anoxic environments in which these animals seem to have evolved. So biomorphosis complicates the reconstruction of early brains using, especially using lungfishes or urodels, as they are likely simpler than, than those of their ancestors. So this makes the, the brains of Anuran the, the best candidates for, for study, and we will take them as a model to continue uh, going through, through the brain. So let's start with the medulla of amphibians. Uh, the medulla does not show major changes in, relati in relation to, to jot fish. The main motor areas and sensory nuclei, such as the raphe and coeruleus, are present, and most evi evident, the most evident changes are in the region of the octavolateralis column, which was present in, also in jawed fish with lateral line inputs. This has been lost in, in amphibians, and as mentioned before, in the book of Tulan, uh, it's only preserved in some larval stages. This nucleus is thought to have been transformed into an auditory nucleus, called the dorsolateral nucleus because of its anatomical position. However, uh, this is not a primitive cochlear nucleus and it's thought, it's thought to be a, an aneurysm innovation. About the cerebellum, we can say that it shows a great variability in size between these lineages. Uh, perhaps it can be also explained uh, by the pyodomorphies mentioned before. But at a cellular level, it doesn't show many, many changes. It does have Purkinje and granular cells, and the connectivity uh, is similar to, to other vertebrates. The most notable changes is the loss, is the loss of the cerebellum-like structures that we find usually in, in fishes and are usually related to, to the lateral line. Functionally, the cerebellum seems to be still involved in motor control and has been seen to be more developed in arboreal frogs than aquatic or terrestrial ones, uh, so reflecting the, the motor behavior. On the other hand, uh, the cerebellum of frogs also has been related to the tongue pro protrusion uh, neurons usually used to hunt. Uh, moving to, to the midbrain, uh, we can find the same subdivisions than in fishes with the tegmentum, tectum, and torus semicircularis. The tegmentum uh, seems not to have undergone many changes and remains related to motor control. But for the better study tectum, uh, we can say that it receives multi-sensory inputs. Um, the, and its outputs uh, project mainly to the tegmentum, the medulla and thalamus, among others. Also important are the reci reciprocal connections with the ismi nuclei. Logically, uh, it seems to be involved in spatial orientation behavior, like in its jawed ancestors. And finally, about the torus semicircularis, that it was already found in jawed fish and its homologous to the inferior colliculus, it receives inputs from the auditory, auditory and vestibular pathways, among others. And similar to other structures, it has lost, it has lost its generation of lateral line structures when, as tetrapods move, move to land. So now it's the turn of the, the encephalon, as in, in, as in jotfish, it divided into pretectum, thalamus, pretalamus, and posterior tubercle. These structures are homologous between tetrapods and, and jotfish, and, and seem not to have undergone many, change, many changes in the transition to land. Uh, however, we can find striking differences between lineage, lineages. Here we have another example of pyomorphosis of urodels, in which you can see that the encephalon is much more simple than, than that of neurons with less migrated cell bodies away from the ventricle. And we can say that uh, although not much is known about its function, uh, it has been linked to hunting and, and prey selection. So about the thalamus, its main outputs are directed mainly at the preoptic tectum, tegmentum, and spinal cord, but also, it also projects to the telencephalon. In, in particular, the anterior thalamic nucleus projects to the septum and the pallium, whereas the central uh, nucleus projects mainly to the, to the striatum. About the hypothalamus, in, as in most vertebrates, uh, is a complicated region of the brain to study, but based on gene expression patterns, there are a large number of subdivisions that seem to be quite conserved during whole, the whole vertebrate evolution. In aneurans, uh, the, the hypothalamus follow the traditional organization, especially with regard to, to its ventral, dorsal, uh, rostral and caudal regions and its topological position. 
both the telencephalon uh, also underwent several modifications with the transition to land. Also, lung fishes and, and amphibians have an evaginated telencephalon. It's worth mentioning that silicons uh, appear to have a partially averted uh, one. It's difficult to tell because uh, a huge thickening of what seems to be the, the medial pallium um, makes it difficult to, to observe the topology of this telencephalon. In the anurans, the, the pallium can be easily distinguished from the subpallium, as we see in these images, by the expression of, well, by the presence of gabaergic neurons in the subpallium and the, the expression of MX1 in the pallium. The subpallium uh, in stone is comprised of multiple structures, such as the amygdala, septum, striatum, and pallidum. And in anurans, as in mammals, the striatum projects uh, to the adjacent pallidum. And then this one projects also to more distant edges. In anurans, also the striatum itself uh, projects has also long descending projects or projections. In general, the, the striatum and the pallidum are not as structurally distinct in amphibians as, it, as they are in, in mammals. In summary, many of the subpallial structures seems to have changed little during water to land transition. Uh, however, in the pallium, we, we can also find the, the classical subdivisions from ventral, lateral, dorsal, and, and medial, with the medial pallium uh, being the, the, most the more enlarged in amphibians and in some lung fishes also, although it's not as big as in silicons. In fact, this structure uh, contains numerous migrated neurons, as you can see here. Um, and it, it, in contrast to the lateral and ventral pallium, which remain relatively thin with cell bodies uh, close to the ventricle. The dorsal pallium uh, instead remains um, difficult to de delineate as it receives olfactory input in addition to thalamic input, but doesn't project outside of the telencephalon in, in these animals. And no genetic criteria seems to have been established. In fact, the authors even wonder if a dorsal pallium uh, exists at all in amphibians. So also the lateral and ventral pallium also receive lateral, uh, also receive olfactory input, as you can see here, and project to the medial pallium. In turn, the medial pallium projects to the subpallial structures and the hypothalamus, as also do the, the ventral pallium, and the ventral and the lateral pallium, sorry. So all this data together suggests that as vertebrates move to land, olfactory input in the telencephalon became even more restricted. It also seems that the connections of the medial pallium in the lung fish and amphibians are reminiscent to the amniote hippocampus, as it is its function, supporting the idea that these two structures are morbus. Behavioral data and on our neurons suggest that the implication of the medial pallium in spatial and navigation, navigational memory and stimulus specific habituation. Uh, here we can see in this plot uh, an experiment in which, after a lesion in their medial pallium, toads were in. Um, were unable to identify a moving dummy prey, so they continued to approach it while intact, uh, intact toads uh, lost attention for it uh, fairly quick. So summarizing, the brains of early tetrapods did not become larger or more complex with the invasion of land. If, any, the, if anything, they seem to have become simpler. And this trend towards brain simplification was carried even further in some long fishes and uh, urodel amphibians. Um, early tetrapods were probably less pyromorphic than modern salamanders and lungfishes, but their brains were still relatively simple, perhaps as an adaptation uh, to low levels of oxygen underwater and in relation to, the, to their big genomes and cell size. Uh, as these animals transitioned to land, uh, their brains underwent, underwent several adjustments in order to adapt to the dramatic changes in these animal senses and, and locomotion. So on that would be the very quick summary of the chapter. Uh, thank you for your attention. Now we will leave you with Luis and Malcolm Talks. As we said before, Luis is going to talk about evolution of thalamo telencephalic connectivity and Malcolm about the implication of water to land transition on the visual system. Uh, remember that you can participate in the discussion through the, through the Ask a Question feature in Crowdcast. And remember that we will invite you by default to the stage in case you, you want to ask something. So in case you, you don't want, you, you prefer us to read the quest, your question instead, uh, you can indicate in, 
when you write it. Thank you again. And without further ado, I will let Luis proceed. Thank you, Alice. That was that was uh, great. It was a great summary. Uh, yeah, you you are muted. Uh, can you try to to share your screen and unmute yourself? Ah, you're sharing. Um, um, the title maybe is a bit uh, a bit exaggerated. But uh, I wanted to touch the thalamus. I wanted to touch a little bit the, the possible targets of thalamic connections in the transeptron. And uh, maybe I will also talk a little bit of animals which are not amphibians. OK, first, am I, I am interested in putting the thalamus in, in prosomatic position. Basically, you know that in the, the forebrain contains everything that is not blue here. So the midbrain is green, the transeptron is yellow and the orange and red domains are the secondary prosencephalon that includes hypothalamus and telencephalon, and the eyes, of course. Within the diencephalon, we see there is a tripartition with the protecton at the back, then the thalamus, and then the pretalamus at the front, corresponding to three different prosomeres. And these, uh, the, the so-called, uh, the names, thalamus, pretectum, and so on, they come for the other domains of these neuromeres. That means that we need, if we go to this image where we have uh, this labeling here, we see that the thalamus uh, is largely negative. This uh, alert domain, you can see in red, the, where is the alert basal boundary? And you can see that the territories we label pretectum thalamus, and pretalamus, all of them belong to domain dorsal, dorsal to the alert basal boundary. And underneath what we have is what you can call the tegmentum or the basal plate, the, the tegmentum. In the classical literature, conventionally, this sometimes is called called the hypothalamus, but this has nothing to do with hypothalamus, which uh, only exists a uh, rostral to this blue line. So this is the boundary of the diencephalon with the hypothalamus. This is the boundary with the midbrain and the midbrain with the hindbrain. OK, so once we are inside the, this domain, we move to other markers. <clears throat> and here we can see, for instance, OTX2, which are a very early marker in the forebrain, and, and very nicely shows a number of boundaries, like this boundary of the insertion with the hypothalamus, the alar basal boundary here, the boundary between thalamus and pretalamus, and the boundary with the protectum, and the boundary with the midbrain. So, and also the boundary of the, at the ispus of the midbrain with the hindbrain. So this identifies nicely the thalamic region. We see a little bit of an area that appears here, dorsocoda, above the mind avoid the mass of the thalamus, which is the epithalamus, also known as habenula, as you can see uh, labeled here. In this case, we have a different gene, ENC1, which appears in blue. So you can see it's a very uh, pleiotropic gene in the brain, but it labels nicely a large part of the basal domain all this domain below the alar basal boundary. And you can see that the abenula in the in the thalamic region is selectively labeled, but not the rest. On the other hand, we have uh, immunocal binding staining that shows you us that the, the a, a large territory of the thalamus, but not all of it, because there is a negative sub-area here, which we call the anterobasal domain. Uh, uh, is negative, and most of the nuclei in the thalamus develop out of this. All this I am showing is mouse. Eh? Uh, a, a classical marker for, for the mouse thalamus is the GBX2 gene, which you can see here in green, and you can see also GBX2 in blue here uh, with different counter stains, just to show again the, the how distinct the thalamic mass and its habenular uh, adjacent accessory structure, how distinct they are in the forebrain of, of, the, of the mouse, but also of all vertebrates, actually. If we jump to the to the frog, <clears throat> we see here with acetylic stress stand in a sagittal section. Again, this will be the midbrain with the torus semicircularis and the tectum. This will be the ismic nuclei and the cerebellum. And here you see the pretectum, the thalamic structure with the abenula on top. And you see the pretalamic structure and the boundary with the hypothalamus and the transition dorsally into the the telencephalon. Here you even see with the, with this staining, you can notice that the so-called anterior thalamic nucleus appears with some activity of this enzyme. 
uh, particularly in a line of cells just at the rostral boundary, but also in a field, in a triangular field just behind that. On the other hand, other structures in the thalamus uh, are largely negative for this marker. If we, if we, I don't know why we don't see this thing here. We should see it, but I, I, I don't get it. Okay, let's jump it. Uh, <clears throat> so this is uh, the map we obtained using this colonist stain. ten. We produced in '96, uh, and here I have uh, highlighted in in, in rosa, in pink, the the thalamic structures. Here is the anterior domain, the, the central nucleus, the dorsocaudal, and here this is at, at a deep level of section close to the midline, and this is a section level a bit more lateral, more close to the super surface, and there at this position again we see uh, the, the dynamic masses limiting caudally with the protectum and rostrally with the pretalamic cell masses like we had here. Interestingly, there is an oblique plane that you see better here that separates the lateral posteroventral nucleus from the lateral nucleus and the uh, geniculate nucleus <coughs> appearing in the dorsal dorsal to this line. And this sort of plane, oblique plane, can be uh, seen also a little bit here, separating the anterior component from the central component at deep levels. This is, I think, important for what we are going to talk later about the connectivity with the telencephalon, because different connections occur when you pick up axons coming from here as when they come from this part, the same here to here. So the, this oblique plane is an important plane separating different behavior in the connections relative of the thalamus with the telencephalon. Okay, here we show an example of the tiger salamander, which is the animal studied by Herrick when he postulated his famous uh, columnar model. Here, this is the drawing prepared by Herrick himself. And there you can see the mesencephalon, the isthmus, the sulcus limitans, which is more or less corresponding to the alar basal boundary we draw here in this way. You can see that he also had a general idea of this of this boundary there. And then he has uh, these divisions between different parts of what he called the diencephalon, including hypothalamus. But uh, here you have a, a comparative photograph of material I prepared in, in collaboration with, uh, with uh, Glenn Northcott when I visited his lab in the 90s, early 90s. And uh, I never, we never published this material, but actually what it is, I knew that carretinine because work I had done before in chicken and in lizards and so on was a good marker for the thalamus in general. So I told Northcott to let's map carotene in, in the tiger salamander to see how it looks like. And that's how it looks like. You can see here uh, fibers of the chiasma and the supraoptic commissures. You can see fibers of the peduncle dividing into the upper uh, root of the peduncle coming from the thalamus and the the ventral root of the peduncle coming from the brainstem. You can see the, what is the dorsal ventral direction here and how in both cases the fibers become longitudinal as they extend caudal walls. Uh, the thalamus is limited by the retroflex tract, which is a completely triforbal transversal tract going from dorsal, actually originates in the abenular region in the sense of the way to near the floor plate before turning back. And you see also a little bit of the ending of the optic tract, which becomes here in the chiasma. So the optic tract is also a longitudinal tract, completely perpendicular to all the interprosomeric boundaries and perpendicular by, by the same reason to several of the supercellular longitudinal boundaries defined by Herrick. So the basic problem when comparing columnar with prosomeric models is that when he says something is longitudinal, he means transversal. That's, that's my point of view. Okay, uh, the next point I want to touch is that the thalamus, uh, as we have seen here, already has several subdivisions. Actually, when I explore this issue of subdivisions, not only in the frog, but in lizards and in the chicken, in the mouse, what we discover is that actually there are three main subdivisions of the thalamic mass. Here you see material prepared with calbinding for the lizard, and you, here you can see the, the abendula, the retroflex tract moving from dorsal to ventral, exactly along the 
interprosomatic boundary between protectum and thalamus. And you can see the thalamic uh, ovoid mass underneath the venula, and it's divided into this mass, which we call ventral tear, this mass, which is called middle or intermediate tear, and this mass, which we call the dorsal tear. So there are three uh, more or less well delimited and molecularly different. Uh, phenotypically different uh, cell masses, primordial masses, that later can even subdivide into smaller nuclei, but basically they have some sort of unity. And at different section levels, this is a bit lateral to this section, you can still see the dorsal, the intermediate, and the ventral components. And we, when we move close to the ventricle, you still can see the dorsal, the middle, and the ventral components. So the, the mass of the thalamus, at least in, in lizards, very clearly uh, divides into three dorsoventral uh, tiers, <coughs> which will form differential nuclei. I can advance to you that the anterior component of the frog thalamus corresponds to the the dorsal tier. So this is what is, we call anterior in the frog, and this is what we call the rest of the thalamus in the frog. Actually, it's divided again into these two other domains. If you jump to the chicken, uh, I did a paper with uh, Redis in the in year 2000, we are mapping calretinin, the uh, different different calretinins, here you see CAD7, CADHIDIN, CADHIDIN7 or CADHIDIN6B, and you can see uh, the idea of the protectum, the thalamus and the pretalamus, and how we have the amenula or epithalamus, and then the dorsal tier, intermediate tier, and ventral tier. And this is the patterns we observe. There are labelings with particular cathedrins that selectively label the dorsal tier, but not with this other cathedrin, it stays completely negative, and this other distributes into this uh, tail-like portion, dorsal portion of the intermediate tier, and there are other characteristics of change in the marker, you can label separately and you can distinguish these boundaries that are analogous to the boundaries we saw in the in the reptile. If we move to the mouse, again, the, we found some molecular evidence with SEMA4F that you see here in blue, and this again is protectum, this is pretalamus, this is the the, the stria medullaris tract moving into the amenula. And there you can see also the boundary between alar and basal being we sort of distinguished here. And here you can see in the thalamic mass, you can see a dorsal component, an intermediate component, and a ventral component. I can say that the ventral component of the thalamus is the origin for the medial geniculate nucleus, the acoustic part of the thalamus develops at this ventral most part of the thalamus, which is also the earliest born neurons in the thalamus, according to autoregraphic neurogenetic data. Whereas the dorsal part are the latest neurons in the thalamus. So there's a gradient, very important gradient, going from ventral into dorsal. <clears throat> and uh, we will see that, therefore, that this subdivision seems to be pretty much uh, general. Uh, I did a review on this topic in the year 2001, and there I suggested that in the lamprey, we have very small dorsal tear if it's there, because it's not clear that, uh, that the, the corresponding part of the telencephalon is going to exist in this animal. But if it exists, a little bit of dorsal pallium in the, in the lamprey forebrain telencephalon, then you should have a little bit of dorsal tear there. Then there is other parts of the pallium will get projection from the from the intermediate and the ventral. And you can see that the, as you pass into amphibians, there's a certain increase of this territory. And already within this dorsal territory, which people call anterior nucleus, is where you start to get a primordium of the lateral geniculate nucleus. So there's a very small lateral geniculate nucleus primordium with the neurons all close to the ventricle, but the dendrites entering a superficial retinal recipient neuropile. So we already start the beginning of the lateral geniculate in, in frogs. In the case of the reptiles, you see that a large increase in this territory and also an important increase of the intermediate tier. And we start to see a distinct acoustic nucleus called median nucleus in this 
uh, sort of animal because it lies uh, close to the to the ventricle and not superficial as happens in the mouse median geniculate. And in the chicken, we have exactly the same pattern as in lizards. Uh, this a large increase of the dorsal tier and large increase in the lateral geniculate population. But still, we have a big rotundus nucleus, which has, is an important visual nucleus, but does not receive retinal input, but receives its visual input from the tectum in the midbrain. Okay, so we have this uh, this series of, of connections of the thalamus uh, relate to this tear structure. And we when we move into the mammal with the large increase in surface of the cortex, uh, of the neocortex in the in mammals, that's when you expand enormously the dorsal tear. Maybe you obtain a fourth tear at the at the top, composed of the associative thalamic nuclei, I don't know about that, but it's perfectly possible that it's an added fourth tier that was not existing in none of the precedent animals, but still we have a lateral geniculate in the same topological position as we have since amphibians. And then we have a reduction, an enormous reduction of the intermediate tier, but there are still some rest that we call posterior thalamic area or region or nucleus, depending on the author. And then we have the ventral component that uh, where we see the, the migration, the radial migration to the surface of the complex of the medial geniculate nucleus. So that establishes the relative position of lateral geniculate and medial geniculate as being close one to another, although they are always separated by this derivative. Here you see some example of sagittal section from the cheek showing the GBX2 marker for the thalamus theoretically labels the entire components. And you can see at different, at different section levels how one can distinguish the dorsal tier, intermediate tier forming the big nucleus rotundus in the in the in the bird that is the position and then you see underneath the position where we are going to get the ovoidal nucleus which is the name for the uh, homologue of the medial geniculate nucleus in the cheek so uh, this pattern therefore corresponds to this pattern and in general, the size of the dorsal tear correlates with the increase in size of the pallium. Pallium in general. We will enter now into subdivisions of the pallium. So this connectivity of the three tiers of the thalamus is in, in the following way. The, the idea first was reported by Anne Butler with 94 and 95. She mentioned the idea of a colo thalami, colo Colo uh, connected uh, thalamus, or sea, a thalamus receiving its con afferent sensory connections coming from the midbrain, and lemnothalamus, a part of the thalamus receiving sensory input coming from sensory nuclei elsewhere in the brain stem or from the eye uh, in general. So, this lemnothalamus is what appears here in darker color at the top, just under the avenula. And this lemnothalamus, when we follow its projection, it typically ends with terminal fields in the what we call the dorsal pallium, which is supposed to be the unlage, the evolutionary unlage of the neocortex in mammals. <clears throat> if instead start from the visual input arriving through the optic tract at the optic tectum, then we move from there into the intermediate. Uh, tier of the thalamus where the nucleus rotundus projects but not to dorsal pallium but to a portion of ventral pallium, a selective subdomain of the ventral pallium which is in general a domain related to olfactory input coming from the olfactory bulb and so on but still there as it increases in size it develops a particular nuclear regions which receive uh, input, sensory input coming from the intermediate tier or from the ventral tier of the thalamus, as, as happens here, from the auditory input that arrives from the auditory pathway to the torus, from the torus comes into the medial geniculate and from the medial geniculate into another specialization in the caudal part of the of the ventral pallium. So there seems to be a connect, connective property that is different when the thalamic neurons form part of the dorsal tier as when they form part of the of the so-called colothalamic portions of the thalamus which correspond in my classification to intermediate and ventral tier components. So for me this is a general feature that should be studied or every time you study connections between thalamus and telencephron you cannot forget that the pallium is not uniform that is divided into parts 
or however you call them, but there are parts, and each one of them has its own specialty, functional specialty. And the same happens with the thalamus and its parts. The thalamus, each part also have different regions specialized in particular inputs and outputs, and different targets in the transception, and different sources of signals, and so on. Okay, so this is quite complex thing. Um, people may think that thinking of three tiers is it's already too much, but if since every, every single tier divides into, let's say, half a dozen to, to 10 nuclei, definitive nuclei, that means that uh, that explains that in the human, the thalamus may contain on the whole some 50 nuclei in the th human thalamus. So if you start subdividing and subdividing, that's where the concept of field homology becomes important, which I like. I know that in the book it's criticized by, by Street and Oscar, but I approve and I support strongly the idea of field homology that once one has one particular field, this field might be divided into two, into three, or into 12, or into 20 subnuclei, but the whole field still retains some sort of genetic identity, at least as long as you can show that there are regularities in its properties like this connectivity property, which is not essential because it could change in evolution, but still uh, there is a general genetic background that is conserved. And also, of course, every single nucleus that differentiates in, inside one of the tier must be somehow different in its molecular profile and its, its uh, functional aspects. Okay, so if we move on, <clears throat> we go to the subdivisions in the fractal inception, we are already advanced. The general schema is this one, that you have a medial pallium, a dorsal pallium, and then you have in the, in the, in the concept of three parts of the pallium, uh, uh, a lateral component that is more or less olfactory, but that which we should divide it on the basis of, of genetic evidence into a, a, a lateral, a, a smaller lateral pallium, and a, we added the ventral pallium concept here at the bottom, close to the boundary with the with the striatum. Uh, important in when you see as the schema is that this is when you cut at the middle of the hemisphere, rostrocodally. If you go to the rostral end or to the caudal end, then the medial pallium meets and fuses with the lateral pallium. So this connects with this at the front passing in front of the dorsal pallium. If you go to the back, the same happens. The medial pallium connects with the lateral and ventral pallium at the back of the hemisphere where you have the amygdala. There you see again a connection. That means that the dorsal pallium is never a completely longitudinal component of the telencephron, but is a sort of island-like isolated domain in the center. That means that if your section just happens to pass rostral or caudal to this island, then you will you will not see any dorsal pallium here because you are caudal to it or you are rostral to it. So you have to be lucky to be cutting exactly the level where in a particular uh, anamniote, the, the island for dorsal pallium may be quite small and you may not be at the proper level of rostrocodal section. So that means that you have to solve the problem by using uh, molecular markers. This is the only way I can imagine well, how can one identify. And this is what, for instance, uh, Maria Toshes has been working upon this idea to identify different regions using um, transcriptomics and, and uh, looking for appropriate molecular profiles for these different areas. Recently, there was a paper by, by Nerea Moreno from the Gonzalez Laboratory in Madrid, where I, I found it extremely interesting that she found mapping relin in a sort, some, this sort of cross-section of the frog brain. She found evidence for the ventral pallium and for the lateral pallium, exactly the, the inner nuclei, because the, this territory is peculiar in that a difference with the other parts of the pallium, it has a cortex at the surface and has nuclear masses inside, deep to the cortex. This does not happen in dorsal pallium and does not happen in the hippocampal pallium. But here it occurs. So we have olfactory cortex at the surface. Theoretically, we don't label with this gene, but the nuclear masses do label. And here you see the, the distinct 
two masses that were predicted by this by this model. Interestingly, relin is also supposed to be an important marker in the telencephalon for the evolution of the cortex because relin cells are supposed to originate in a lateral position. Now we see that in the frog they are here, and then they migrate tangentially into the remaining parts of the pallium, and from where they sit, they will be producing a relin, which is a diffusing protein that apparently attracts postmitotic neurons from these areas into uh, trying to get into the cortical plate into producing a cortex. So that does not happen in frogs and does not happen apparently in reptiles and does not happen either in, in, in chicken and in birds, but it does happen in mammals. In mammals, the presence of relin positive cells at the surface of the brain helps the production of the cortical plate in the neocortex. So you don't have a neocortex, if you, a normal neocortex, if you don't have a proper uh, distribution of relin secreting cells. So this is, a, for me, a very important result that uh, Moreno and collaborators have produced just last year. Okay, now the connection described. Uh, we, we, you already saw this image that uh, if you label uh, intracellularly one neuron in the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, then what you get is projections entering through the medial wall, through the septum, extending through the medial pallium and finishing in either dorsal or dorsal and lateral pallium portions, uh, which is a very, for me, a very peculiar not connection, but a peculiar pathway, because in birds and in mammals, as far as I know, in neither in reptiles, are there any sensory connections to the cortex uh, passing through the septum? So this would mean that here we do have something in, in, in anamniotes and in frogs in particular that are completely different from anything we have in the amniote uh, telencephalon. Um, is it possible that an homologue nucleus has changed, mutated in such a way that its axon no longer select this route and select instead a lateral route to reach the same targets? But just reaching up, that would be the, the route followed by an reptile, an obsidian, and a mammalian axon coming from, from this, which will be for me the anterior domain, which is the dorsal tier region of the thalamus. That is lemnothalamus, according to Butler. Okay, but if you take up a connection coming from the other part of the thalamus underneath the line, any connection coming from here apparently in the frog finishes mainly in the striatum, and the authors normally never tell you where there are any terminals passing the boundary between striatum and ventral pallium, because I suspect that in many cases we don't have some terminals ending in this small territory of the ventral pallium. When authors see connections here in the striatum and just some fiber tips finishing there, they don't give importance to them because at that time people, we are speaking of experiments done in the 80s, in the 90s and so on, they were not uh, conscious of the ventral pallium, the existence of a ventral pallium that was going to be an important part of dorsal ventricular reach and was going to be a, an important recipient of colothalamic input, which is the one that's produced by seizures. Uh, in fact, all colothalamic inputs to the ventral pallium give collaterals to the striatum. So that tells us that, that uh, when we have connection with the striatum, we might have, and I, I predict that if you look with modern technology, you will find that all of these axons have terminals finishing here. So that there is striatum plus ventral pallium which is an important, will be an important result if it were demonstrated. Now to finish, some uh, in the book I saw some comments that there was very little evidence of retinal input to the thalamus in frogs, but I do have personally evidence that this, the, these two areas at the rostral end of the thalamus consisting in a narrow pile called uh, uh, Geniculae lateral dorsalis uh, narrow pile with the corresponding needles sending the drives into these narrow paths appears in the dorsal tier and the intergeniculate leaflet with another retinal recipient narrow pile is existing inside the anterior part of the intermediate tier. Homologs to this structure, of course, occur also in a mammal. 
this is the lateral geniculate nucleus, and this is the intergeniculate nucleus. The mammas, in addition, have in the pulvinar inferior an additional input there that, curiously enough, jumps against the rule because it receives both direct input from the retina and indirect input coming from the superior colliculus. So, so there is at the pulvinar both as uh, colo and lemno input into this particular novelty associated as we know to associative cortex and not to primary visual cortex like this one here. So if frogs have really this, then we must ask where do the axons from these few neurons in the thalamic anterior complex go? Where do they? Nobody has really demonstrated that. Probably because there are few of them and must be technically difficult to observe it. Here, this is part of my evidence. These are horizontal sections from an uh, optical projection from RANA with uh, dextranamine injections in the retina. And here you can see this telencephalon. This is the pretalamus, this pretalamic retinal recipient centers, nucleus belongi and ventral geniculate nucleus. And here we come to the thalamus. It's counterstained with calretinin to see where is my dorsal thalamus. And here you can see the anterior complex this is a dorsal section moving into more ventral. And here you can see uh, the anterior, the anterior, the anterior that diminishes and practically disappears. When it practically disappears, that is where people have detected the presence of a few neurons with dendrites in this optical neuro pier that appears in the thalamic side of the boundary. So if I, if I trace this boundary separating pretalamus from thalamus, then it will come here. Uh, uh, sorry, in front of this neuropile, so because this is the rest of the pretalamic visual input area here. Okay, so at the back, you can see the beginning of the pretectal neuropiles, <coughs> which are here. <coughs> so um, in this plane of section, one can nicely see the, this pattern uh, establishing the possibility of a small uh, geniculate uh, nucleus in the thalamus of the frog. Um, and by the way, in these uh, preparations, you also see the apparently a tract originating in the anterior complex. As you can see only here, when the anterior complex is present, once the anterior complex disappears, you no longer see this tract. And this tract apparently moves directly into the telencephalon without passing through the peduncle, although it points up a little into the peduncle, but actually it goes separate from the peduncle and reaches the amygdala area. In the, so this is a thalamo amygdala connection here that nobody speaks about, apparently. And finally, I have here some data about the acoustical pathway comparing a reptile and a mammal. This is the position in the midbrain, it has superior colliculus, inferior colliculus. Uh, in the reptile, it's called already torus, but this is the mouse with the superior inferior colliculus. The pathway moves into thalamus, where you see the medial geniculate homolog in the reptile near the ventricle, like the one in the frog. It was described by Neri in the 70s. And then we have the migration into the surface of the mammalian medial geniculate. There's a, there's a core and a shell populations which are different, so that's why it's coded into different levels of gray. And then the connections coming from this colotalamic component, here's dorsal tear, intermediate tear, this is visual, and the auditory ventral tear, now it goes into striatum, and then it moves into auditory area of the ventral pallium. And then we don't know, because there are no data, where there are any collaterals approaching the cortex path probably in reptiles and in birds, this arrow does not exist. But if you move to the mammal, then you have the connection from here that move into telencephalon and then connect with striatum and then connect with a de the derivative of the ventral pallium, which is the lateral nucleus of the amygdala. This is a very well-known connection. And then we have collaterals extending all the way into the cortex, neocortex, into the auditory cortex. So. This is the evolution of the auditory pathway from the inferior colliculus, which is a colothalamic input to the thalamus, which goes into neocortex, which is a dorsal pallium derivative. So this is in a way as an exception that goes against the lemno colo rule of Butler, showing that the evolution can do whatever it wants to do. But in any case, I think that this sort of schema, keeping in mind which part of the major territory you are in 
both in the Telencephalon and in the Thalamus, is very relevant if you want to understand what's happening in evolution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. That was, uh, that was great. Uh, yeah, so uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one from Katia. Yeah, uh, Katia Howard. Okay. I don't know how to pronounce Howard, maybe. Uh, sorry if I didn't pronounce it properly. But I would like to ask also, Luis has a question. So maybe Malcolm, uh, Paul, uh, would you like to comment? And then we will, we will uh, invite the audience to make questions. I guess my 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 one comment is um, I I think it's super interesting that the thalamic processing of visual information doesn't really show up until amphibians and and then it's 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 very slight and that is what goes really really yeah. blows up as animals get more terrestrialized that that's a fascinating <laughs> pattern yeah. for me <laughs> well we have to we have to check when some things are so small you have to check very carefully whether what happens with other amniotes it forces looking at, to look yeah. again with me, better modern modern methods because you see what's happening with the, the lamprey and greenness lab and so on no <laughs> Right, right. But at least you can say well, yeah, yeah, if that's, it's there, that's, it's yeah, very small. <laughs> yeah. Paul, would you would you like to ask your question uh, before we invite in sure. Katya? Can you hear? Me? You muted. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I I kind of like like Malcolm think that it's. Um, it's very interesting that you're seeing these things and 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 I think it's almost like we should we sh we should just get Grillner to study salamanders <laughs> for us and and, and that work it, it's the methods methods are so good right the modern methods or someone else i mean i guess maria tuscus is doing it um well, i actually had a had a question because when you were describing the the different yeah. tiers of the thalamus in the context of the yeah. you know lemnocolothalamic and and the visual and, and auditory input uh one thing that struck me is i i was under the impression and maybe it's an outdated one that um that the sensory modalities were not really so clearly segregated in the amphibians and only really became in the thalamus at least segregated in amniotes maybe i'm mistaken about that um what is the status of that notion, in your opinion? Uh, I, feel, I think that considering that the methods used were initially just degeneration studies, mm -hmm. which are quite imperfect and not very sensitive, and that only very recently have people started to use uh, more efficient transporting methods, but still no optogenetic studies have been done, I would predict that all this topic needs to be re-examined with optogenetic uh, labeling of connections. I think that we are like at the beginning. When mm -hmm. before we had uh, Kappers, Huber and Crosby saying about connections where they thought they saw in normal material and then suddenly there was a generation techniques and suddenly there was a, a tresor of new results and so on. Then came the transporting methods and now we have new genetic methods which will clear up the, the whole the whole thing in an unexpected way. Every time I look at an experiment looking at connections with the novel genetic methods, I see things I never saw before. Mm. So there's a very clear difference in, in technical capacity. The so, so when we say an animal is primitive, maybe we're actually just talking about ourselves, you know, that we're uh, just looking at it in primitive I, way. I think that one has to be cautious nowadays but uh, if you are not using molecular methods and you are not using then your conclusions are unsafe that would be my my, my, I, mean, my, I, I think my, you, may, my you may be right about that because in in my in my, to to me it seems like with every study we we find that things actually are much more precise you know every every in, in any in every aspect of neuroscience yeah because the, the technique improves no but what what is the meaning of a of a physiologist that tells you that there is visual input to medial pallium in the frog so what 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 credibility what credibility do you give to that 
Well, a lot, a lot, or a little, or none. I thought the the consensus was that there was lemnothalamic projections to medial pallium. In yeah, but if we, I think that if they go through the septum, they are not lemnothalamic. They are something okay. else. You think it's so? That's there's something else. Because you cannot change a pathway like that. Yeah. You need to change a lot of molecules in order to change a pathway from the septum into the lateral wall of the hemisphere. How many adhesive proteins or how many contact uh, reactions at the membrane of axons do you need to change to produce that? Well, the septum uh, is adjacent to the medial pallium, no? I mean, the septum, yes, but not the lateral pathway. No, okay. The problem is that, that all amniotes go through the lateral pathway, all of them, and none go through the through the inner pathway. So that's a problem that for me that is a clear result showing a, an important difference between anamniotes and amniotes. Mm -hmm. So this this change was important. And you and believe that was a change that happened on the uh Amphibian. Along al along the invasion of the terrestrial medium, of course. So yeah. be because fish didn't have that, so amphibians were at the beginning of the change, and, and for somehow the change occurred when reptiles appeared because reptiles already don't have the septal root; mm -hmm. they already lost it. It was during the amphibian period, pre-reptilian, when the thing uh, happened apparently, but it was not in one day or in one afternoon. It was during millions of years. <laughs> and that means that the change was slow and genetic. The, the change was not of, of physiological or behavioral. The change was genetic. You alter the, the, how the axons grew. And you alter the properties of the thalamic subnuclei. And you alter the properties of the telencephalic subnuclei. And all these molecular changes produce novel connectivity. And novel, some novel functions probably, but uh, but still, uh, the evolution had to work with what it had before. It had to construct on what existed before, which was the anamniote brain. So you start from that, and then you start to introduce variation and novelty, and then selection will select. That's the theory of Darwin, no? That the, is selection the main. The main decider there is not the I need to I need to do this or I need to do that. It's not by your needs. It's not tele teleologic. It's because it just happens, and then it's selected. So that is my way of trying to understand the whole thing. There are many obscure points, of course, many. So many many things I would like to to see data it, from data. A, seems to be a discussion of this. <laughs> There seems to be some points being made from Jorg and Maria Toskis also on the chat. Apparently, I see a comment by, by Maria Toskis that she has some data personally about connection input into ventral pallium. So I, that, that I find uh, I am very happy about that. George, yeah, yeah. George has mentioned a paper in which they they trace the dendrites. I don't know if you can you are reading this, uh, Luis, in the chat. Uh, He's mentioning Roth et al. 2003, in which they use pretty modern uh, techniques to trace dendrites and axons. Okay, yeah, I'm so downloading it right now. Well, the point is that it is not. Uh, I I I I think I don't want. I, I am not interested in conclusions about the whole thalamus as a unit because I know it has parts. And so what, what any part can change individually and mutate and create new pathways and new functions. So that means that that uh, what we need to, you cannot forget the part, the, the divisions. That is why I I always insist that at least you, you do your homework with your anatomy. So uh, functionalist people like to simplify and say, okay, the function of the thalamus is to be a relay of signals to the to the to the telencephalon. Okay, that's true, but it tells very little. When you want to understand vision, then you have to say, okay, which part of the thalamus relates to vision, and which part relates to audition, and then you see it's located. The functions have a position. Why? Because the cells need to specialize in order to become more selective uh, relays. 
you cannot be a good auditory relay if you are identical to your visual colleague. You have to be different first. That's the problem. So that the progressive evolutionary division of a common embryonic field into different parts is the, the is requisite. You need it in order to obtain differentiation and obtain more structure and more function. It's the only way you can do it by 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 dividing the primordia. That's why why I defend that one has to do all this evolutionary well, thought in connect in connection with development. You cannot forget development. Uh, well, but at some point though, at some point. I don't but, hear... but at some point, um, you want to have integration. Um, you want to have integration yeah. of input, uh, for example, in a, in the tectum um, that's maybe visual and yeah. that are that are sort of co-registered in space and like the deep layers of the uh, tectum or something. So, it, to some degree, uh, sort of parallel spatial maps. And so, it could just be but, that but, but, you know um, but, that happens at relatively the, the early case of the stage. Mid Synaptic steps in some animal in, later. In the case of the midbrain, the integration of, of different modalities is a, as an intrinsic part of the function of the tectum. It needs to have these signals together and it, it divides them into layers, but and probably even there are some cellular specificities. But if, for the function of the tectum, you don't want to separate, you want to unify. And, and probably the uni unification. But of that's also at the true. Very, at the beginning. So I, th I would say it's also true for the parietal uh, cortex, though, in primate, where you have where you have somatosensory visual information all converging uh, in in a sort of a functionally useful way, for, for what, uh, even though it may have been coming along. For what purpose? No, no. For what functional purpose would the would the the, the pallium want to mix sensory modalities? What for? Well, for for motor control. In the end, it's all got to come together. Right, so for orienting, for example, the parietal cortex, just like in the superior colliculus, that, that, that is done by the midbrain. Space and auditory. The orienting is done by the midbrain. You, what you can do is you connect, as mammals do, the cortex with the midbrain, and then you can control how sensitive or how attentive the the midbrain is to a particular stimulus. No, if you want to follow within a crowd the most beautiful girl, then you do it. So maybe you don't, sorry, you, need to, you don't need to do it in the cortex. You do it using the midbrain. <laughs> sorry, uh, Luis and Paul. Sorry, this is great, okay. but we have still a to go talk on. Okay. by Malcolm. I was trying to invite Katia on the screen, uh, but uh, but maybe she's having some issues, internet issues. So maybe we can start with Malcolm's talk, and of course we can uh, keep uh, Katia's question for later. Actually. Uh, we have a, a time I should keep in mind. I guess nominally we were supposed to be done by now, but do we have a time we're supposed uh, to it's, be done uh, by? In, For you is uh, three, no, how is it? Uh, in Spain would be 8 p.m. Uh, so well, how minutes. many more minutes is uh... yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, if you share your screen. Should I start? Okay. Good. All right. Can you yes. see it? Excellent. Okay. Um, thanks to the organizers uh, for the, the invitation to talk um, for the for the book club, and I very much enjoyed uh, Streeter and Northcutt's book uh, when it came out. Uh, I, very few books, uh, nonfiction books, I would describe as page turners, but uh, this would be one of them. <laughs> so I, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, so I'm going to tell you about some changes in the visual system in the late Devonian. Um, and uh, sort of I, because it's only a, a short talk, I, I just want to tell you that for a review of, of how moving on to land changed brain more broadly. Um, I wrote this review with Barb Finley recently that is now out. Um, 
where we go through a lot of uh, like the physical ecology changes and how that affects the motor system and degrees of freedom and so on and so forth. Uh, and then um, I've done my, my lab is really started to focus a lot on um, what the evolutionary selective sort of benefit of planning circuits in the brain uh, was. And that's a little hard to get to from a paleontological perspective, but uh, our first uh, our first attempt to get to it is computational, and and that's this paper here. So uh, I won't have time. I might briefly sort of um, talk about a couple of things that come up in these two papers, but largely have to focus on the paleontological work, which was done with uh, Lars Schmitz, who's a proper <laughs> paleontologist. I just started this work. I'm an electric fish person. I started this work seven years ago with him, uh, I basically Googled paleontologist that works on eyes. And uh, he agreed to meet with me at a bar at SickBee. <laughs> and I, I convinced him to, to help me out uh, and to work on this project together. And it's been super fun working with him. And uh, a lot of work was done by my then PhD student, now a postdoc in the Reddish Lab at University of Minnesota, um, or John Mugon. So um, yeah, where my interest in this on a biographical sort of note, personal note, uh, was uh, I've done a lot of work characterizing uh, the sensory envelope of elect weekly electric fish and the hunt prey at night in dark waters. And this is the envelope uh, for their, detec their detection envelope for the, one of their favorite prey, which is Daphnia magna, a water flea. Uh, and so you see, you know, it's about 200 millimeters long and about uh, 90 millimeters wide, and it's cylindrical. It's omnidirectional. A little bit weird. It's sort of like having the retina, a retina stretch across your entire body, but that's that's uh, electrosense for you. Pretty weird. Um, and just for fun, in this paper uh, in 2007, I compared to visually guided hunting of the same type of water insect. And I found uh, Stone Morocco, whose, whose sensory cone for Daphnia magna had been documented. And I computed the volume and it actually computed the sweat volume, taking into account their typical search speeds. And I was really floored by the fact that electrosense volume and uh, Stone Morocco's visual volume was roughly the same sweat volume. Because uh, as, as we well know, the these electric fish have to devote a good amount of the metabolic energy into the sensory field, uh, whereas these guys are just parasitizing the energy of the sun to uh, see as far as uh, they do. And I just thought this there has to be something wrong. Surely visual cones and underwater are much better than that. So I did some um, preliminary calculations on how vision works in water, um, and here's. Uh, roughly the message of on uh, along the x axis here we have visual range in meters for a 10 centimeter uh, diameter black disc in full sun okay and i'm looking at three different eye sizes this is kind of a typical eye size for an underwater vertebrate this is not too atypical of a a, a tetrapod on land our eye size is 24 um and now uh we look at two different water uh, um, uh, types. Uh, this water uh, is super clear. This is like an, a super clear sample. And in fact, the range we have here, 49 meters, is very close to what you get if you compute uh, this whole thing in absolutely clear water with absolutely no uh, um, pollution in it. Um, but it's close to 49 meters. And look what happens as you increase eye size basically nothing. Uh, you go from 49 to 54. And in more realistic water, uh, coastal waters around uh, coastlines and uh, uh, water, fresh waters are considerably often lower than this. Uh, you, you go from 7.2 meter to 7.7 .7 meters. And keep in mind, you know, eyes are costly tissue, right? And so um, when, I, when I saw this pattern of, of data, I thought, well, um, what's happening with, with air? Well, um, you can see that in air with this size eye, with 
you know, there's, there's some assumptions here we have to make for the computational modeling, but it it confer, it sort of matches empirical measurements as well. You get half a kilometer with 10 millimeters, and you go up to over a kilometer um, with a with a 30 millimeter eye. And when I saw this pattern of information, I thought, well, okay, so let me find all the papers that paleontologists have written about how eye sizes must have increased at uh, the water to land mm -hmm. transition, because surely this is a well-known fact. Um, I happen to know Neil Shubin, who's just down the road from us here at Northwestern in Chicago, and he's at University of Chicago, and, and he, I asked him, so... Um, because uh, I couldn't find the papers. And he said, you know, we've noticed that, but nobody's actually made much of it. And I was really surprised. So we went, uh, Lars and I went and collected data. And what we were curious about, like a lot of, it's been a lot of work, including by Neil Shubin, on what has happened in the shoulder girdle area and the pectoral fin area in sarcopterygians as they, as they moved up on the land. And it's super fascinating. Oops, ah, pardon me. Super fascinating what's happened there. But we wanted to change our focus to what's going on uh, around vision. And so we we looked at essentially the orbit diameter and uh, across 59 taxa with measurable skull length and eye socket sizes. I should say, you know, there's a lot of stuff I can't show you about uh, the, the correlation between eye socket diameter, even taking into account the tricky issue of scleral plates, is very tight with, uh, with estimated visual range in extant animals. So we suspect that this, this is a pretty reasonable proxy. Uh, so we selected taxa narrowly that narrowly bracket water to land transition to maximize our ability to pick up trends. Um, and here's one particular specimen from between 380 and three, around 380 years, million years ago, a thin tetrapod. All right, so we look at skull length and we look at eye socket length. Then we assemble a phylogeny from published sources and we divided this into digited tetrapods, a group, uh, Adelis bondal colostides that I'll go into in a sec, uh, Elpisus phagalians, which are including the famous Tiktaalik and then fit, fin tetrapods, which are sarcopterygians that you know well and love, like the lungfish and coelacanth. Um, so the big question that I absolutely had no idea how to tackle that uh, Lars really uh, is a specialist in is when you look at traits over time, how do you sort of determine what is kind of drift and random diffusion through fitness space versus uh, adaptively selected for. And so the question is, is it something like this or is the difference more like this kind of a diffusion thing? And so you use Ornstein Uhlenbach models of diffusion and see if that actually explains the data. And it turned out it did not, the, the change in orbit size with, around that period could not fit uh, a diffusion um, approach to, to trade evolution. There are clearly separations. Uh, and so the, the two zones of separation that we saw was uh, we identified here on the tree. Uh, one is here, I'll put numbers on these later, but it's 1.4 here and it goes up to 1.5 at this branch. And then we have the super interesting kind of nearby control group of this group of animals, the adelospondyl colostides that reverted to water and actually went back basically to the aquatic uh, orbit size of, in this case, just slightly over unity. Um, but so uh, here's, uh, here's some of the, the actual sort of eye socket length data. So our finned tetrapods were at 13, our transitional animals are at 24, and then the digited tetrapods just narrowly bracketing the transition go to triple the size of the, uh, the, the finned tetrapods. And then the colossids back down to basically not statistically significantly different from the, the, the starting pattern, even though they descended from terrestrial animals that presumably had something more like this pattern. All right, so there was, uh, there was a bit of a tricky issue, however, 
So let's think about these Elpisosagalians. Um, <clears throat> so here are the numbers, 1.4x of the, the root node uh, for, for orbit size going up to 1.5. Uh, and that tricky issue is this. Uh, the Alpistostegalians are primarily aquatic. And you can kind of see that uh, in, in the, the fact that they, they have pretty limited rib cages. Rib cages are there to prevent squishing of your internal organs because you go from essentially neutral buoyancy to the full force of gravity on you, which has massive effects on the mechanics of movement and breathing and all this stuff. And... Um, you know, uh, you don't need a rib cage. Use an opterin, doesn't have one. Uh, if you're fully in water, um, tiktaalik and um, allied animals in this branch have some limited amount, but nothing approaching a full rib cage. And in fact, there's a bunch of different signs, including the lack of separated digits, that they are primarily uh, aquatic. And so the whole thesis that I got motivated to pursue was, hey, you, get, you come up on the land, you get a release from constraint, you got to have bigger eyes, uh, presumably. And when I saw this initial flack of data, I was like incredibly depressed because it's like, well, how do you explain that? I mean, obviously our thesis is incorrect. Um, uh, but 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 we, we looked a little more carefully and, um, you know, uh, the thing is, is that it, the, the data was very solid that the a big increase in eye size for vision underwater seemed highly undermotivated. Um, and so the uh, question was, like, could there be other explanations? And one of the things you'll notice if you look at Euthanopteran's skull shape in comparison to the Opistostegalians and uh, there's this really nice new paper by Per Alberg on uh, Parmistega, which fits this pattern beautifully as well, uh, but isn't in this tree because it came after our paper. Uh, but basically, the flat the skulls get flattened. This is a little more flattened than they were actually because it's very dorsal ventrally compressed in the for, for, from the from the fossil uh, from the fossilization. But nonetheless. Um, the general form of the skull was something is something like uh, a crocodile, um, and you see these eye orbits are are kind of posed on these uh, above the skull table uh, on these raised ridges. Um, so that uh, led us to sort of uh, sort of the hypothesis, which you know uh, we 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 don't have proof of, but is certainly very suggestive from the morphology, that we go from something like a euthanopter in, in the water column like this, this is some 3D renders of some models we made long ago, to something like Tiktaalik doing this, and for what? Uh, is it for looking at uh, invertebrates up on uh, the, the, the shore? Uh, invertebrates preceded vertebrates by about 50 million years. Um, there's a problem with that idea, and that is that uh, these these are not small animals. Tiktaalik was around two meters in length, and the, the idea of a Tiktaalik sort of finding uh, lots of food that was invertebrate uh, and getting enough fuel from that seems questionable. But you know, maybe there are other things on the bank, like dead dead fish. Who knows? One thing I'm kind of interested uh, as a sort of hypothesis is that. You know, the, around the same time, animals start exhibiting these larger and larger breathing holes in their skulls uh, called spiracles, which were mentioned in the summary. And this is uh, corresponding to a decline in the oxygen level in the atmosphere, as estimated by a variety of models. This is from a paper in 2011. And that's a, the time of a major increase in eye size. So, you know, a lot of these... Um, Sarcopterygians developed lungs to breathe air, despite the fact they're aquatic animals. And so you can imagine there are a ton of these animals coming up to surface to breathe. And if you had eyes just above the water surface looking out, you could imagine hunting by identifying mechanical disturbances and, and, and little waves that would occur as an animal comes up to breathe. Um, who knows if it's true? Who knows if that we could actually find evidence for this? But this is 
one possible reason for why animals might have evolved larger eye sizes before full terrestriality. Um, and here's, a, by the way, a, a skull of Parmistega that Per Albert just um, published a paper on not long ago with these giant orbits um, sitting on top of the skull. And, and check out, he has a figure in his paper. Here's, here's Parmistega and here's a modern caiman. <laughs> Pretty uncanny in its, in its similarity. Uh, all right, I'm just going to quickly sort of sort of describe some thoughts about where this is going in terms of my own research interests. Uh, I've done a lot on prey capture in, in water with uh, both electric fish and larval uh, zebrafish. And the general uh, thing you see is, you know, aquatic, visual scenes are blurry with the odd organism in them. And if you look at biomass breakdown, uh, total biomass breakdown, meaning essentially food for other organisms. In water, it's primarily animals. Um, in, on land, it's primarily plants. And there's 100 times more biomass on land, but it's 95% of it is plants. That's a fascinating pattern when you think about the role of the hippocampus for place foraging and keeping keeping track of locations of space where food energy is to be found. Not a huge benefit to doing that in the water column when there isn't a lot of uh, landmarks handy. Um, but on land, that's that's something different. But in any case, thinking about the prey capture dynamic, you know, you basically the, you see these things at very short range and you've got to fire off either escape or attack very quickly. And as you many of you might know, the there's this modner cell that's in the the brains of uh, of animals up through to amphibians, and then they disappear. But these modern cells gave, basically give you a 10 millisecond reduction in the onset of your escape. Um, and so you're really pressed up against your kind of biomechanical limits here in terms of quickly seeing something and either lunging or escaping. And that's the aquatic condition. And a cartoon of it then might be if this is the space you're immediately moving into, and this is your sensory space. They're basically the same space. They're basically unified. They're one to one, roughly. And then you detect a, a predator, and you gotta, you know, flee. Uh, and in the terrestrial domain, again, a hundred times more biomass, a lot of food there. It's mostly stationary. Um, it adds a lot of texture to the visual scene, and you see a hundred times further. Uh, so now you, if you had the brain circuitry to do it, you could still, you basically still have the same muscles and you have the same immediate movement volume, but now you can potentially contemplate future possible trajectories and understand that, you know, this is probably a low value one because you're going to attract the predator. This one will probably get you eaten and this one might actually get you to safety. And so if you have the capability to withhold an action pattern and and measure or calculate the value, the estimated value of the different paths, that would be a huge advantage. <clears throat> and so this brings me to this quote from uh, psychologist Bruce Spiridgman that, uh, you know, a lot of people think consciousness is like, oh, this basic sense of, you know, touch or seeing the redness of red. But uh, I love his naturalization of the concept, which is consciousness is the operation of the plan executing mechanism, enabling behavior to be driven by plans rather than immediate environmental contingencies. And it's it's kind of like, yeah, that's what we have a dorsal pallium for. And that's what we have, you know, thalamic connections to pallium for. Maybe, you know, just, just a thought. And I, I, I think it's kind of, this is a cartoon I, I love about the water land transition. Why don't you just stay and work on being a better fish. I think maybe many humans are asking this question at this point, but it's kind of funny that fish couldn't perhaps have thought of this question without first having come up on the land. If in fact, self-awareness is derivative of the kinds of control circuitry you are selected for on land. So the, the basic idea then, as I said, was, you know, maybe you need an imagination once faced with the tableau of the richness of land with those huge visual ranges and imagination to, to, to look at these different paths and evaluate them in your brain uh, through sort of this virtual 
uh, process. <clears throat> and indeed, um, you know, as we all know, the brain's got basically 10 times bigger uh, between uh, these um, uh, uh, an anamniotes and, and amniotes. Um, and, and some of that brain tissue seems to likely be about something like this additional complexification of behavior. Um, I think, yeah, I'm going to, there's, there's this one short fun video that I collaborated with a bunch of artists and filmmakers to make, and they kind of did their own twist on the story. And I wanted to share it with you as sort of a fun, uh, end to my talk. Um, so let me play that for you. Almost 400 million years ago, some adventurous fish made a huge loop that eventually led to the evolution of humankind. They decided to come up on land. We humans probably would never have evolved the intelligence we have today if not for that move onto land. Why? Because it vastly improved our eyesight. According to neuroscientist Malcolm McIver, the way we think about the world is closely tied to what we can see. And fish can't see a whole heck of a lot. That's mainly because light doesn't travel very far in water. Our ancient fish ancestors lived their lives in a constant fog, so their brains evolved to react quickly to whatever suddenly appeared on the horizon. McIver had a theory that the move to land expanded our aquatic ancestors' vision, and in turn, their brains. To test his theory, he and paleontologist Lars Schmitz spent a year running simulations with fossil data. Their research revealed new clues about why fish came onto land in the first place. It all seems to have started when the first fish peaked above the water's surface, Suddenly, it was able to see 70 times further, and behold, a smorgasbord of tasty land dwellers. To capitalize on this discovery, the fish would have to evolve. Its eyes soon moved to the top of its head and tripled in size, and its fins began evolving into limbs so that it could stalk its new prey like a crocodile. Hunting on land was a mental game changer for the early tetrapods. Their total sensory volume increased a millionfold, giving them a much bigger window into the future. The first animal that figured out how to plan accordingly instead of just reacting would have had a huge evolutionary advantage. Iterate that kind of natural selection a million times, and eventually we have something called prospective cognition. That's our ability to weigh different options for the future and choose strategically. To this day, fish have not evolved those kinds of complex planning skills, but many land animals have. Understanding the evolutionary roots of intelligence helps explain how humans got so smart, but also why we are so dumb. We've evolved to deal with the things we can see in the here and now. We still don't plan well for things that are too far away in time or space. Will our vision ever evolve so that we can see the faraway consequences of our actions more clearly? Evolution won't make that happen anytime soon. But understanding the relationship between vision and planning may help us engineer solutions like using technology to bring faraway things closer, that just might give us the evolutionary advantage we need to survive the next 400 million years. Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll end there and happy to uh, take questions or just continue this uh, great chat. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, I, I really love the movie. <laughs> Thank you. It was very fun. Maybe you can share the, the, the oh, link sure. in the chat yeah. so people can... Let me stop uh, share. How do I stop sharing here? Yeah, oh, so, uh, there it is. Oh, OK. Uh, I, can, I can do that if you want. Um, so I don't know if uh, Paul or Luis want to comment. Uh, 
make a, a comment Almost we have Tapio also who wanted to make a question but Luis Paul uh, otherwise I will I will invite Katya to the stage what, one animal starting ah sorry no 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 you're, you're okay. Uh, I, I try to, to put the time, the, a realistic time dimension to this that we see in the film, not the whole story, but at least the, the early stages. And, and, and I, uh, we have to imagine that the animal did not reach optimality in their physical proportions immediately. So they, they approach uh, 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 slowly over millions of years optimality. That means that the functioning in between had to be non-optimal, suboptimal, but still enough to maintain them alive, at least statistically. So, yes. Uh, sufficient number of them were able to continue living in order to be able to, to be still alive. And then slowly they become better and better and better until they became optimal. Probably yeah. w when they become optimal, that's the, when they were in danger, because if the medium changes and suddenly there, were, there was no food of the type they were optimalized to, maybe then they, 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 they got into a big problem because they cannot change back again without yeah. spending the, the same number of millions of years. I think, uh, yeah, something so, to the so great pro advantage. Pro pro probably, mo mo I was thinking yeah. that mo most animals that disappeared in evolution is because they optimize their physical proportions to a particular system of life. And suddenly this system was became impossible and then they had to die. What do you think of that? Yeah, I, I think uh, there's a lot to what you say. And what I think of is the fact that the first vertebrates to invade land had nothing but small invertebrates to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's not a lot of danger. And, and in fact, uh, there seems to be this, it took 10 million years for the orbits to, to get larger. Yes. It, took, it took longer than that for weight bearing to be secured on limbs. It's very clear that body drag and the tail was dragging mm. a lot of stuff for a very long time. There were these training, as a training wheel period for these vertebrates, these early vertebrates were, which lasted tens of millions of years. But thankfully, everything else is in the same position. So it's not like something was running after you on on uh, fully weight-bearing limbs yeah. as you yeah. slung yeah. around the shore. Yeah. They had a lucky period in which they could be imperfect and still uh, go go away trying this new, these novelties and so on and see what happened, no? Because that's what they did. They just did their best every time. And sometimes they eat, they ate, and some other times they could not eat. So it depends. As yeah. still happened with us, no? Yeah, and I, you know, I think that you know, why would you, why would you go from, you see a target, say, uh, five hundred meters away, and why not release the motor pattern to go for that target, if your, if your prey doesn't yet have the control circuitry itself to recognize that something is approaching from that far away. There's no reason to. So yeah. probably it took a long time before there was any selective benefit to withholding approach and going, ah, maybe I should go behind the tree first so that my prey doesn't see me. Um, I imagine that took a very long time. Yeah. 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 And, a, and a lot of selection as well, yeah. because the, the decision was taken by selection, not by them, them reflecting what was best. Correct. Yeah. I would I would add a little bit uh, related to that uh, to what you said about planning planning and and you know using vision that you know for it seems that you know for a long time the visual visual motor you know the the elaboration of the visual system was really all about the tectum that the, the dorsal yeah. pallium really didn't really contribute very much at all and in fact even in reptiles. Um, it's hard to find evidence for anything like retinotopy in the, in the dorsal cortex. Um, and so, you know, real, you know, so, so essentially something like the tectum, the optic tectum was, was driving a lot of that pursuit. And maybe, as you say, it's just direct pursuit, R run right at the prey and the prey run right away from you and just avoid some obstacles along the way. 
and and you know that really ca- continued um, long after we even split off from the reptile. Yeah. So yeah. some dinosaurs maybe went over this, and then of course yeah. birds, uh, and then yeah. you know, and, men- and so this this work we did uh, we published in Nature Communications a bit ago. We argue that the selective benefit of planning is restricted to certain terrestrial terrestrial geometries. And those yeah. terrestrial geometries are ones characterized by clusters of occlusions and then areas of open space. Uh, and what's what's interesting is that that's also conditioned on having a visual system that's somewhat higher off the ground. If you're if you're really close to the ground, like uh, like many reptiles are, you're essentially stuck in the high ent- what we call the high entropy condition, which is a high clutter condition where we show, at least computationally, that planning has no advantage over habit. Where you gain huge advantage is when it's patchy and when you have enough height off the ground that you can use long visual lines to detect prey or, or, or targets or, or adversaries from a long distance and then act strategically. That seems to be... So, so I think there's a lot going on. Yeah, that's really of- interesting because you see it in the animals that have this sort of parasagittal gait, where they really put their legs underneath their body and exactly. stand up. And build. Exactly. Ones exactly. That are and as you it. might know, that's also linked yeah. to the evolution of endothermy. Yeah. So the ability true. to move rapidly over, over ground, which is uh, cor- cor- correlated to a large increase in the brain as well, uh, seems to be connected to that pattern. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's almost like, I don't know what came first, but it seems like the ability to generate that much energy was really a prerequisite for getting all these other things going, like like yeah. walking upright and running fast and planning and having a big brain. Yes. I mean, there, I think we have yet to fully understand all the constituents. I just came across this work uh, a few months ago showing that until the evolution of the four-chambered heart, animals had to stay low to ground. And, 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 and that's part of the reason re- reptiles have to stay low to the ground is once you're higher off the ground, the, 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 the reptilian heart does not have a sufficient driving capacity to actually get blood up to the brain. But that's also what gets your visual system high enough off to have long sight lines, right? So it might come down to st- stuff, very basic metabolic issues and on blood pumping issues and having the right heart. <coughs> Well, that's that's going to be chapter six, I guess. <laughs> that's great. Thanks. There were some questions. I think. Yeah, I'll invite uh, Roberto. Because Katia was not able to connect. Uh, yeah, he accepted. So could, did any animal uh, invade land to eat plants or it's not worth it? It's just to eat other animals. Oh, well, so no, I think uh, so herbivory, uh, this very nice paper called Late to the Table. Um, you can read off the dentition in the fossil record that herbivory started about, I think it was 40 million years after animals came up on the land. And that was a huge, huge step because, as I said, there's 100 times more biomass on land than there is in water. And and that's plants. Uh, most of it's vascularized plants. Herbivory in water came after herbivory on land by 60 million years. Uh, this is a paper that uh, was published a while back show, showing that. Um, mm-hmm. Burmese, uh published a review on this. Um, so herbivory on, on water came only later. And in fact, as, as far as I can tell, only one family of Telios are, are proper herbivores. Um, I wonder if that's true, because I, I have a hard time believing that, but that's as best as I can tell. Uh, so it's, it's, herbivory is really, you know, kind of a land, a land, a big land deal. And it's where a ton of calories are available. Uh, so, you know, initially... Uh, animals came up on the land uh, for whatever reason they did. All, they certainly were only eating um, other animals or invertebrates or other vertebrates. Um, and only later did um, did hunting or eating plants okay. come up. What What about the, the capacity to evade predators? 
Well, I think that's very basic. You see that in the aquatic uh, realm all the time. Um, well, it's not, well, not only the food you can find, it's also the, the pressure that if I stay anytime longer here, somebody is likely to come and eat me. Right, right, right. So detection and, and um, hiding from adversaries on land. I, I'm not sure. So, so um, the, big, the big thing that happens is now you've got aud auditory, chemical, and visual senses that can, um, uh, you know, can, can give you longer range on, on land than in water. And so uh, you're going to get alerted, usually, with more forewarning. So if you can hear that something bigger than you is approaching, you're just going to get out of there <laughs> as quickly as possible. Or find a hole. To yeah, find in. a hole. A hole is a good place to go. Okay, so we had Katya who wanted to make a question uh, before. So please, Katya, whenever you want. I think you're muted. Ah, oh, no, you're fine. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, um, the re representative of Katya. <laughs> <laughs> but so f f first, I, I wanted to, to shamelessly, shamelessly pass an announcement because I think that, that you will be interested. So the, there will be a, in 30 of May, I'm, I'm just pasting it in the chat. OK. Uh, the, um, uh, I, I can't because it's too long. I will just split the thing in two. Um, <laughs> But I think first of all, like yes. thank you for the great talks. Like it was really amazing. Like both, like all of your talks. Also, Alex summary. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, really fascinating. I wasn't aware of these studies that you just recently uh, showed, like about the evolution of the position of the eyes and the size of the eyes, and like mm -hmm. super interesting. Um, and also, like uh, our question was actually for the talk of of Louis. Yes, but so the the, the the talk that I wanted to to uh, announce is by Matteo Mosio, who has been working on the the theory of biological autonomy, which is like the most recent iteration of the theory of autopoiesis, and I think that it could be interesting for for the discussion because the, so there, there's the issue of the the organism and the importance of the organism in addition to the importance of selection. So the the fact that evolution doesn't just work on selecting whatever it works in producing selection in an organism that has to comply with certain requirements, which in this case is organizational closure, right? And then the idea of agency is a, a very, impo very important in, in for, for biological autonomy. So it's not any type of uh, system that, that's selected by evolution, but it's a system uh, with organizational closure that's able of uh, agency, which is defined in, in pretty pretty precise terms in, in, in their theory. So that's the, the Moreno and Mosio book that, that, that describes uh, what they have been working on. I think you, you, would, be, you would be interested. Thank you. And, and so uh, we, we, we will uh, talk about the, the, the link later. At the moment, we haven't really announced that, but I just <laughs> the opportunity. Um, so my, my question, uh, our question was for the, the presentation of Louis, and it's like actually a very nice question. So you were showing a, a series of regions with a pretty um, neatly defined borders. Um, is, is it the case that some of those borders may actually be more something like a, a gradient? And would there be a way of evaluating if one, uh, like going all the way from a, a very neat border to like a quite abrupt gradient to a very smooth gradient. Um, because like what's interesting with the gradient is on, on, when you have part A and part B, they are homogeneous and then there's no difference. But a gradient gives you some sort of direction. You know? It will tell you uh, region A blends into region B, but probably not necessarily with region C. Well, in patterning mechanisms, as we know, the theory says that if you have one nice gradient, what you need is some in the genome, you need to have a translating mechanism that will be sensible to particular levels of uh, thresholds. That means that uh, you have the gradient and that this can be divided into two, three, four, or seven different uh, steps that the, the, that the genome can interpret by producing differential readout of, of different genes and stopping some gene expression and static some new genes and so on. This is a property of the genome that can evolve. So the, the genome can evolve from taking a field with a gradient and divide it into three or it can divide into four. So that's why a new subdivision is possible, theoretically. Because, but you need to change the genome the way it reacts to concentrations of particular signals and so on. That's the theory. Mm 
but I, I I don't know of any particular case where this has occurred, or I am sure this has occurred. I mean, but it, it's very well possible that it happens, no? So, so mm -hmm. but the, on the other hand, the fact that the morphological structure of the brain tends to have stayed pat during all the time of the vertebrates, that means, for instance, the, the number of rhombomeres in the hindbrain is the same in lampreys as in man, means that, that this anterior-posterior patterning system has not added any single neuromere. It's the same with it began, it stays stay, stay with the same for the moment, at least this particular system. But in theory, you might be, be able to evolve uh, a, a gradiental mechanism. Uh, in, in the case of neurogenesis, for instance, you can also use a gradient to obtain steps in neurogenesis or just a smooth gradiental neurogenetic change. Usually the papers on, on neuronal birth dates, they give you a lot of data about gradients going this and that. Mm -hmm. But in my experience, when I have looking in more detail at the molecular boundaries in between and so on, it, I have the impression that they are not precise enough. So that the most of the data about uh, birth date, uh, gradiental patterns are not not very credible. And usually the gradients occur inside particularly molecularly homogeneous areas. There's where you can find real gradients. But once you pass a boundary, usually there's a different rule and different genes are there. And then suddenly the, the proliferation, neurogenesis, everything happens with different rules. So the molecular profile is, is the, the, the chef. So the, the ordering thing is which are the genes that are being read here? If you have this set of genes, then you have rules, and then you can have gradients or steps or whatever you want. But for this field, once you pass the boundary to the next field, other rules are there. They may be similar if you have enough similarity in the gene patterns. They may be similar, but they are different in a, in a sense that they don't obey to each other. The, the frontier is like the frontier between France and Spain. In Spain, <laughs> we speak Spanish, and in France, they speak French. I don't know why, but they do it. <laughs> but but did, you, did you ever wish, for example, that for at least for some of the boundaries, you would have like a different type of line? Like probably in some boundaries, you, you know, like you pick your yeah. black pen and then you go. Phew, when you see, when you see a aquarella, no, like like when, water. When, when you see when you see a boundary, usually it's because there are about 300, 400 genes which are different. Some uh -huh. of them are up and others are down relative to the to the other field. So every time you see a, bound, a morphological boundary, you are speaking of, of several hundred genes. That means that changing that, that's why it's so difficult to change the big boundaries in the brain, because you no, cannot change only one gene or two. You need to change for hundreds mm -hmm. to make a new boundary. So that mm -hmm. is why the brain tends to keep the boundaries it gets. If they try, if the evolution selects them and they are good for being alive, it's very difficult to introduce a change in the structure. That's why pallial domains and thalamic domains and thrombomeres, all these sort of things, once they appear and are proven to be useful for survival, they don't change. But that, 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 because that's it's a, not because it's impossible, because it's difficult. Yes, it's, it's another possible. point we were discussing with, with Katya, because when you look through evolution, and we are mostly looking at the evolution of uh, mammalians, so for, yeah. for a longer, long period, brains tend, tend to be like rather on the smallish side, right? Like a, a lemur or something like that. And, mm. and, and of course, when you change, when you split a branch in the phylogenetic tree, that means, uh, as you mentioned, no, like a lot of change, coordinated change that, changes that will make that, for example, now, in this branch, you have a cytoarchitectonic pattern uh, that, that would be different or a pattern of connection that would be different. And that involves the change in many, many, uh, at least hundreds yeah. of genes. The, but the then major, very, the, very recently, when, when you move to into, into humans, that, that's relatively fast. So, but the number, the increase in the number of cytoarchitectonic areas is massive. No, you go from probably about 20, 25 in mice to probably 250 in humans. How do you explain such massive change? Because if, if you imagine that every time that you need to make a new region, that means a change in hundreds of genes. How could that happen so fast? Right? I, I would, I would, I would like, I understand the audio. Uh, I, I think I would like to have data which I don't have about which is the, the, the promedium size of an cortical area. 
Do you know in volume or in area? Because it would be good to know. Because I suspect that there is a limit there. And like a, a limit that if you are too big as an area, if you increase in size and become you pass a given threshold, suddenly the cells cannot be maintain the same genetic program. So there is a, a threshold of size that if you pass, then you have to become two. Because th there is a half of the of the tissue that does not recognize the signals from the other half. So that because would be it's too far away. Selection. It's the same reason why in South America there are so many countries and not a single country, South America. Yes. Why? I think our countries are larger in general than those in, in <laughs> because Europe. because there's there there is a problem of size and, and how, how how many people can stay together into a particular uh, complex. I yes. think that in the in the embryo, in the brain, when the cortex expands, it increases the possibility for more areas because suddenly more areas start to be independent one from another. That's the problem. Independent that would be independent of selection. Uh, independent, well, no, independence of, of varying, being di diverse. Once you vary, then you can try you 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 force with your life, and then selection will act in due time. Uh -huh. Selection will take longer. It will take billion years, but uh -huh. but so probably the the extra areas that we got as humans. But the embryos, the by by one or two mutations, they can increase the size of the of the cortex, and yes. this fact creates a number of new subdivisions. These have to obtain connectivity. They have to obtain circuitry. So there are many tests that will show whether they are useful or not. If they are not useful, selection will come and cut. Like the Neanderthal. If they are useful, then not. Then they will be selected and they, everything is okay. And you have done a step forward in evolution. You see, but but this is okay. a sort of thing. No? So if... Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Katia and, and Roberto. So we have a last question uh, by Barbara Finlay. Uh, uh, I will invite her on the screen and we will finish with this question. Oh, we need to, uh, yeah. I'm trying. Yes, yeah, she accepted. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I'd like to point out one way that um, that uh, divisions between regions or nuclei um, can change. Um, this is these are two uh, research fields that that um, developed almost entirely separately. But uh, early on, people were interested in cortical plasticity in mammals, and we're doing a whole lot of transplant studies to show what kind of uh, thalamic or cortical input would be allowed to integrate each other. And uh, Pat Levitt um, described a whole set of interactions uh, in which he described a particular protein early on, the thing he called LAMP, limbic associated marker protein. And in, in development, um, you put uh, structures containing and not containing that, and you found that they weren't able to innervate each other early on. Nevertheless, uh, that's that in adulthood, those proliferations, I mean, those particular connections proliferate. So that would be like all the neocortical projections into endorhinal cortex are, are something that, that you can't make happen in early development. Now I'm, I'm going for, for two research areas that are completely disconnected. Um, you know, the, the studies about the anatomy of intracortical projections and this odd behavior of embryonic animals has never really been put in, in one place. So maybe there's something really different about those two. But so you really have to think about um, the, the boundaries and gradients as not a single act, but a series of decisions that that can have different subcomponents, and um, you know, so that that gives you a little bit more of a, a way to think about genetic change than than you must, you know, change all four hundred simultaneously because uh, you you can get um, you know, developmental phases that are 
well, if I could get back to that one or another. Well, I mean, if if, uh, the, uh, if you are suboptimal because you are as you are, you are as you developed, there are things you can do. You can be plastic. You can mm -hmm. adapt. You can you mm -hmm. can there are a number of things behavioral or non-behavioral uh, that you can do in order to resolve part of the problem of suboptimality. And in any way. Probably we all are, all living animals are suboptimal in many aspects. So none of us is perfect for everything. Mm -hmm. Also, the, the evolution goes ahead, <laughs> all these uh, trials and uh, mm -hmm. circuitry and mm -hmm. new connections, extraordinary connections, or maybe are just tied in one person for a part of his life. Mm -hmm. But what is the effect on evolution of the species of that? Mm -hmm. Very little, no? So, in order to have an effect on evolution of the species, you have to have a very important, statistically very important effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, I think it, I'm just saying it's a, probably time to start thinking about this systematically rather than than randomly. In fact, so there's some kinds of arrangements of genes that that may prove to be quite quote evolvable unquote, um, and others not. And and it would be good to instead of just getting a you know, single piece of information from uh, a couple yeah, yeah, of yeah. widely differentiated things that I kind of just mentioned. Uh, we should start thinking about this in a systematic way. So, <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Marco? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I was trying to unmute myself. <laughs> um, I, I, I I like that very much, and um, you know. What what sort of what I think about is uh, you know the the modern synthesis gave us this tr tremendously debilitating model of of, a, of an organism being the, re the DNA is the recipe of an organism and and as left as a footnote for the rest of us to think about how do you put together an organism right and and um, you know I think mechanisms like you're talking about where it there's something very tricky possibly going on to allow for structural diversity without at the same time having to do all this work at the level of individual genes. Uh, that's, that's mm -hmm. a fascinating uh, idea. And I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to know more. Well, one thing that, that actually impressed me recently is, is looking at some of the work on just how, um, self-stabilizing the developmental process is um, and this this was worked by michael levin for example looking yeah. at transplanting different you know leg yep. things mm -hmm. to make sound there's extra legs and stuff and it just grows a nice leg and you you can do things that are that evolution has never actually encountered and yet the developmental process is so stable that'll still create a kind of a viable organism. And that to me is, is surprising because I always thought, you know, you mess with, you mess with development, you get all kinds of, you know, monsters. But in fact, the, the process is so self stabilizing that you can get um, at least morphological diversity pretty um, successfully. Um, Mm -hmm. And and for that reason, it's actually to me surprising just how similar the brain topology seems to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you could have things just sort of randomly sprouting new limbs and things, and 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 yet it it's able to use it, graft extra eyes and stuff. You can do all this stuff. Um, in particular with the amphibians, and yet evolution never seems to have done given us you know four-eyed frogs and whatever. Maybe maybe for altogether other reasons, like my mother having four eyes. The problem is that once, once you are a, regula a regulatory organism, if you are regulatory, then then you have you are limited. You are depend on your history. Yeah. On what is the genomic structure that you have there, and what is more possible and what is less possible. So you have constraints, as Wagner uh, comments that you you may know from his book. This also you know, the fight against the new synthesis by Amundsen and other people and so on, um, discussing that there's more to the developmental side of the phenomena. 
uh, in the organismal level, uh, as, uh, as uh, Malcolm says. Uh, so this is important. And so there are collective phenomena that are not point-like that have an effect and must have an effect both in, in you know, improving optimality and in improving survival and fitness and, and, and everything. For instance, and you have you produce a set a very interesting set of data showing that in evolution frequently the alert domains of the brain all increase size in more or less cor correlative uh, fashion. No? Do you uh, I am I hope I am synthesizing your thought uh, well enough. So that 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 deals that when you when you have sets of genes increasing the the growth the proliferation in the telencephalon, in the pallium, for instance, you probably have a parallel effect in the thalamus because it's also in a similar dorsal domain of the neural tube, and a similar effect in the cerebellum, and similar effects in other places. So so that that means that correlatively. The the, the 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 tangents don't need to occur one by one completely independently one from another because they are mechanisms that unify and they produce general effects. So so I always remember this piece of data because I found it very relevant. Yeah. Can I can I ask another question? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I was interested in what what you were saying about the. Uh, um, and developed by the of the medial geniculate and lateral geniculate, um, and and uh, and one thing I've I've always found really interesting about uh, thalamocortical development. I'm sorry to be such a, a mammalian centrist here, but I can't mm -hmm. help it. <laughs> okay, that the um, that it's the primary thalamic nuclei across uh, everything that's been studied so far, which is not a great deal, but they are always produce the earliest and stop the most and they act as if they're clamped in number so the it's the lateral geniculate and the main nucleus of the medial geniculate that, that stay a small size and it's the secondary nuclei uh, like the pulmonar and so forth that, that get very large um, yeah yeah so um, I didn't so first off is there is there a kind of a good uh, comparative neuroanatomy way to look at that and also I don't think you said anything about uh, the skin, the, the skin surface and its representation. So that, that the generality I made. Well, well the, the the medial geniculate is the most ventral, and the pulvinar is the most dorsal. So okay. apply your rule, and, and and your rule predicts that the pulvinar is going to be bigger. No, no, I mean no. So it's I'm trying to find out is there any? I'm not asserting that there is one. Is there any topological or location or marker that would serve to um, make those primary sensory nuclei, the first ones uh, concluding neurogenesis, which is what you see. I, I'm not aware, I cannot answer that question because I, the problem is that it's so complex, complex, involving so many genes that there is not enough data, no, there is not enough experimental work. Well, most, the gene most, okay. most people doing experiments on genes work with one gene or two or three <laughs> at the most. No, nobody, and you will need to deal with hundreds of genes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we are we are well below the level where we can analyze this sort of okay. question. Mm -hmm. we, we are far away from, from that and being able to respond to that question. I think mm -hmm. it's too complicated, mm -hmm. but no, this does not mean that it doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> it happens only; it's very complicated. We are, mm -hmm. we are still in a in a level we don't understand. I wonder. I wonder if, um, if can we think of any or organisms which change their um, sensory to a cortical. Um, mapping in any substantial way and uh, thought of the mm -hmm. blind cave fish but that's across generations mm -hmm. <laughs> going from a surface morph where you have the eyed type mm -hmm. but um but there but there of course the the, the we we just learned that the thalamic mm -hmm. imprint of of that is not going to be present so but, but, uh, but that, are there other, yeah other animals that have changes massive changes in the degree to which they are innervating their primary sensory nuclei I can't uh, think of metamorphosis in some fish i don't know <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I, see, I think that I see that single cell transcriptomics is slowly bringing us closer to being able to deal with thousands of genes. Uh, with transcriptomics, if you do proper secondary testing of where the the different cells group identified where they are, because you need to see where they were, it's not enough to say I obtained 50 groups of cells, uh, different groups doing glutamatergic phenotype. That's just not enough. You have to tell me where they are these 50 groups and if you tell me with enough precision where they are then you can do a step forward probably mm -hmm. because there you are dealing with combinations of many genes so okay. i think that is the next step the next step um, i don't know whether i'm going to see it but because right now many of the transcriptomic studies being done is below level they are they are not good enough they do the, the, mm -hmm. they employ the nice technique which is very potent, but they don't analyze properly the data. So because they don't pose developmental questions, they don't um, are not precise morphologically. They don't question where precisely is my group doing this, this and that. You need to con connect the positions with the variety, the molecular variety, and then you can start looking at functions and other things. Yeah. But if you only have a rough idea, how complex the hypothalamus is in terms of cell types. If you don't know where these cell types are, and then you cannot go on into looking for connections and for circuitries and mm -hmm. for for patterns of behavior and this and that. So so it's, it's a complex, very complex question. And the transcriptomics is going to be a very important instrument, but the, the people need to become morphologues again. Everybody, even the psychologists, will need to do study morphology of the brain. Because without morphology, you don't do anything. If you don't know where the cells are, you are lost. You cannot, you cannot proceed. That's the problem. Yeah. You need to know where these differences are. And how many of them there are. And, and, and within this boundary, how many and which, which ones appear on the other side of that boundary and so on. So you have to classify in a positional way. And that is doing developmental morphology together with molecular analysis. And then you can do functional analysis on top of that. So that well, is the future. On behalf of primate neurophysiologists, I have to say we're far. That, that, that's the future I, I see. I, I, am, I have spent years, literally 20 years, telling physiologists, why don't you look with more detail where you put your electrode, your registering electrode? Because it's really hard. And they, they say, no, we do it because we, I learned to do it this way 10 years ago, and that's how I do it. Okay. I, I, somebody told me once, very, well, he was very happy. You know, I did, uh, how was he? Uh, well, he, he did some, some very modern electri electrical technique. I say, I registered in the septum. Then I told him, in which part of the septum? And he did not know that the septum had parts. So what is the value of that data? If, well, if, I, I tell you, Louis, if, I, if you don't know where they are. I know then, the cortex has layers. I know. I know. <laughs> Head layer, but Ooh, that's I record, something. That's I something. don't know exactly how I'm cutting through the how the electrode is going down through those layers. It's okay. extremely difficult to estimate where we are on the basis of, of of measurement, and we can do very precise measurement, but it but all of them, you know, there, there's always a wiggle room. But, but these topics like the number, but these topics like 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 the number of layers in the cortex, this needs to be analyzed again and again with more precise techniques. Maybe the work that, that Maria Toshis is doing right now will show us at a given point that this theory of the six layers of the neocortex that we have been using since Broadman, which is now more than 100 years old, maybe it's wrong. Well, so I how, can tell how you are you sure that it's right? Yeah. It could be one wrong. The, <laughs> and, the then all the and then all the books on the cortex are wrong. What happens then? Mm -hmm. One of the but we have, to, we have to be prepared to this sort of step forward, to suddenly see that the, the idea of six layers is wrong, that there is something else which is better than that. I don't know what it could well, be. Well, I, 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 I don't know. With Malcolm here, because I think we have asked the, I think there's virtually no study at all that will give you any light 
on the value of different layers of the cortex. Uh, behavioral study, uh, ecological study about, you know, what what possible difference having more pyramidal cells than layer three would have. And I think, and until we get a better handle on the physiology in terms of the kinds of capabilities the animals have, then we can, you can study gene localization for the, you know, next couple well, of I years. Think, it won't be about I think it. one thing which is very important <laughs> is yeah. to know where the cells are, where the cells are receiving input from and where they're projecting to. And I think a lot of the work that's being done in mice uh, is, is teasing that apart. And, you know, in the primate world, we're essentially hoping to, to be able to apply a lot of those. Methods. If I just knew what kind of neuron I was recording from, it would be, it would be incredibly valuable. But right now, I can't, I can't possibly know. For, for instance, if you are a physiologist and you want to register cochlear nuclei neurons, you have to know, you need to know that the cochlear nuclei extend from rhomomere 2 to rhomomere 6. So you have 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 5 rhomomeres. So where are you going to pick up your data? In number 2, 3, and 4, and 5, or 6? Because since they are different neuromeres, they are going to have different genomic profiles, and they will have slightly different specialized profiles of function as well. Okay, so you, as a physiologist, you need to know about the rhombomeres. You cannot go on 20 years after or 40 years after the rhombomeres were discovered and still go on to the rhombomere, to the cochlear nuclei without rhombomeres. How that? How do journals allow a paper on cochlear nuclei to be published without dealing with rhombomeres? It's like I want to, to do and work on the DNA and did not know about the codons and did not taking in, in, into, into consideration what is known about the, the, the molecular divisions. You need to keep abreast of the science that is already known. So rhombomeres are 40 years old now. Okay. And my tears in the thalamus, they stem from year 2000. And we are 22 now, 22 years later. Who is doing research on the thalamus with the tears in the thalamus? Nobody. Nobody. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. That people don't keep abreast of the science of the new techniques and how they seem to be applied. Right. You, you need to, 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 to modernize your, your, your <laughs> steam, your thing that you do. I, I am I'm very irritated, particularly with physiologists, because I have many friends which are physiologists and I continually discuss with them. I tell them, OK, why don't you pick up a mouse that is a transgenic and has room over three and room over five are blue colored and you can see in blue where you are putting your electrode. They don't use it. They don't want to, to change the techniques. They don't. So we... They simply don't. So, Paul or Barb, do you want to add, or Markham, do you want to add anything? <laughs> well, I guess I would, I would just add that I, I completely agree, and I hope we get there someday. I mean, I think a lot of people are recognizing that we need to get there. <laughs> okay, so I, I guess we could stop now because we are 20 minutes over the, the time. Uh, I really okay. thank you. Thank you, Barb, a lot for yeah, your... Yeah, thanks, for uh, joining your commentaries and your questions. Um, yeah. yeah, so thank you well, all. Thank the... you. Great talk, Malcolm. That was mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thanks a lot. So, Great to see you all. Yeah, Bye. thank Bye. you all participants. Thank you for your questions, for your time, and see you in the next session that will be conquering land. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.